Well, um, uh, good evening, good afternoon, uh, and morning for wherever in the world uh, all of you are, uh, our audience, uh, as you join in to our special program uh, this evening uh, in New Delhi. Um, it's an absolute privilege and honor for the Center for Policy Research to welcome Ambassador Nabil Fami uh, to our special series titled India and the World. Uh, celebrating and commemorating India's 75th anniversary um, as part of the Azadi Ka Mah Amrit Mahotsav series. The Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav series is a series of events um, that the government of India, in collaboration and partnership with academic institutions, uh, civil society, media, um, and uh, uh, the broader stakeholder uh, population in India is organizing to celebrate uh, 75 years of India's independence, the progress we have made uh, in these 75 years that uh, reflect um, on the challenges challenges ahead um, and also debate possible pathways uh, as India moves towards the next 25 years to celebrate uh, what we are calling as part of the Azadi Ka Amrit Mahotsav celebrations, Ashatabdi Sankalp, uh, a pledge and plan for India as India reaches uh, 100 years of independence. Um, the Center for Policy Research as part of this series uh, of celebrations has organized a series of lectures titled India and the World, uh, aimed at celebrating India's role in the global stage, or rather on the global stage, unpacking and understanding how our friends, partners, collaborators uh, in the globe uh, have viewed India's emergence over these 75 years as a modern nation state, how India's position and role in the globe uh, has forged itself, formed itself and contributed to global governance, to global gov diplomacy uh, and building a rules-based world order. The world today is uh, confronting many challenges uh, the world order itself is under, under a moment of great disruption and great transition. And moving forward, India is going to play a significant uh, role in, re in contributing to remaking and reshaping what we believe firmly that ought to be a rule-based world order for the 21st century. Through these series, we hope to both understand perspectives on India and India's relationships with the world over these last 75 years, and look forward to articulating the role that India could play, should play, ought to play in this new transitioning world order as we confront today. To debate India's relationship with the world and understand these perspectives, it's an absolute privilege for us to welcome Ambassador Nabil Fami. Uh, Ambassador is an old friend of the center. Uh, back in 2018, I think we had the privilege of hosting you in New Delhi. Um, the world has changed so dramatically since we last met uh, in Delhi. Uh, but on the upside, we now have the advantages of Zoom that allow us to connect and reconnect in different ways. So thank you very much for delivering uh, the second lecture in this series and looking forward to learning from you about India's relationship with Egypt, uh, how Egypt has viewed India, but also how you view us as a nation um, on the global stage and, and how you interpret the challenges that we confront and the globe confronts uh, in the 21st century. With that, may I hand over to Ambassador Sham Saran, uh, Senior Fellow uh, at the Center for Policy Research and member of our governing board who will chair the lecture today. Over to you, Ambassador Saran. Thank you. Thank you, Yamini, uh, for those introductory remarks. And may I join you? in uh, extending a very, very warm welcome to uh, Ambassador Nabil Fahmi. Uh, it will be my uh, pleasure to uh, give a short introduction to uh, Nabil uh, before uh, I invite him to make his uh, presentation. Um, uh, Ambassador Nabil Fahmi, and may I say uh, Nabil, because he has been a friend of very, very long standing, um, Nabil and I were uh, young uh, diplomats uh, working together uh, in Geneva uh, in the early 80s. That was a very different world, as uh, uh, Yamini has said, this world is very different from what we have been used to, and it is still undergoing a lot of change. 
but um, it was a very exciting period uh, also for uh, you know young diplomats like uh, Nabil and myself. Uh, that was a period where uh, both uh, India and Egypt as uh, major non-aligned countries were in fact uh, working together <coughs> to bring about a zone of peace uh, between two you know ideologically uh, confronting, militarily confronting uh, blocs. Um, and, uh, you know, we were trying to find space uh, for those countries who did not want to be in one way or the other and were simply interested in uh, a peaceful environment in which they could uh, develop. Um, so, Nabil, as it would be obvious from what these few words I have said, is a career diplomat, but much more importantly, he is a former foreign minister of uh, Egypt. Uh, he served in that capacity from 2013 2014. Uh, but before that, uh, he was uh, uh, Egypt's ambassador to uh, the US uh, for quite a long period uh, from 1999 to 2008. And uh, before that, he had also served as ambassador, Egyptian ambassador to uh, uh, Japan. <coughs> uh, uh, Nabil founded the School of Global Affairs and Public Policy at the American University in uh, Cairo in 2009 uh, and has been its dean since its uh, founding. And uh, this is an institution which has become one of the centers of excellence uh, in the region. Uh, in fact, uh, you know, focusing attention on uh, regional issues, uh, on issues of uh, geopolitics and how that impacts uh, on the region. Um, <clears throat> He has written a book on uh, Egypt's diplomacy in war, peace, and uh, transition in uh, February 2020. Uh, he has also an Arabic book, uh, which was published this January, uh, from the heart of events, it is called. And um, uh, Nabil was also awarded the cordon of the Order of the Rising Sun by the Emperor of Japan for his contribution to the strengthening of uh, Egypt-Japan uh, relations. So as you can see, an extremely distinguished uh, career, but uh, for me, it is it is this is uh, really a very very uh, important uh, moment uh, because of the fact that it also gives me a chance to renew uh, a very very old uh, association and uh, friendship with uh, uh, Nabil. So Nabil, with those um, uh, you know few words to just introduce you uh, to our audience, uh, may I request you to kindly make your presentation? Thank you very much. First of all, th thank you both very much for this uh, very kind introduction. And I want to thank all the family of the Center for Policy Research uh, for inviting me to this prominent series of contributing speakers uh, on the occasion of the 75th anniversary of e e India's independence. This is truly an honor and I'm not in any way exaggerating uh, in that comment. Some may wonder, and I've already been asked this here in, in Egypt, whether it is appropriate for a foreigner to participate in this auspicious national commemoration by India. I dare say it is most appropriate. In fact, I would even go further to assert that the commemoration would not be complete if it was only by Indians. My logic in reaching this conclusion is quite simple and straightforward. Many of your leaders have inspired others well beyond your borders and India has had an auspicious role in defining the prevailing world order. Therefore, we should all celebrate on this occasion. Needless to say, amongst the numerous reasons why my conclusions are self-evident is that the independence of India cannot be commemorated without recalling Mahatma Gandhi, the great Indian leader who guided your country towards independence. Gandhi was also a generational universal role model for nonviolent resistance, unwavering strength, resolute determination for peoples, longing for freedom across unruly oceans and vast dry terrains. Equally true, India has been a geostrategic heavyweight for many generations. Its singular role in regional and global affairs has been instrumental in defining the parameters of regional and global orders. This is particularly evident in the transformational decades subsequent to World War II and the tenuous times of the Cold War between East and Western blocs. As the world was being reconstructed, excuse me, 
in the ashes of destruction, and a great number of developing countries were gaining independence. Their voices needed to be supported, their interests to be considered and respected. Propagating this view and defending this inalienable right came naturally to India, given the high moral standard of its leaders and that it, it itself had just gotten rid of the shackles of colonialism. Many of these concerns were high in the minds of emerging leaders in my own country, Egypt. Together, India and Egypt emerged as leaders among the developing world in the pursuit of global justice. This was not at all surprising. In modern history, both India and Egypt struggled to gain independence after decades of colonialism in order to build their countries in freedom and for the benefit of their respective peoples. Egypt's Saad Zahloud and India's Mahatma Gandhi shared similar principles relating to their independence, their independence movements. They did not only struggle for their own rights, but they also unwaveringly backed other nations that sought freedom and independence. This continued for decades in the midst of a polarized world during the Cold War. Together, subsequent leaders of the two countries, particularly under Nasser and Nehru, worked alongside leaders of the developing world as they established the online movement. The objective then was to construct an alternative voice unencumbered by Cold War concepts or unjustified and if I may say, even illegitimate assumptions of their leaders that between them exclusively, they could set the world order and lead it. The movement refused to be aligned with either of the two superpowers at the time. Its leaders strived to change the unfair world order that centered around the interests of the United States from one side, the Soviet Union from the other, and their allies, neglecting the interests of other countries especially the development ones. Numerous successes can be attributed to the efforts of the online movement and our two countries in particular. Symptomatic was the vast increase in the number of states joined by the nations, the core institution of the contemporary world order. Ironically, as the Cold War ended or seemed to end in light of recent events in Ukraine, with the transformation of the international order from a bipolar system to a unipolar one, and the world moving, the world moving closer towards a multipolar world. The main purpose and relevance of the non-aligned movement mistakenly seemed to be diminished or less relevant, mostly because it was perceived as being at the center between two poles without giving enough emphasis on its goals and principles. As the Cold War seemed behind us, various questions were even raised about the role and des destiny of the movement. And where exactly could it position itself? This is in fact true. However, I believe that such questions neglect the pivotal contribution of the movement in shaping the world order for over more than half a century towards a more equitable paradigm. The movement had an invaluable role in shaping history in turbulent times. This cannot and should not be diminished, nor is it a process that comes suddenly dormant. It is one that develops as we move forward. This is particularly true in periods of transformation and turbulence as we see today, but has started from the early days of globalization. Some suggestions in a constructive sense were even raised about changing the name of the movement, choosing alternate names like the League of Developing Countries to be more commensurate with the interest of the newly independent developing world. Ultimately, the original name was kept as it is in recognition of the significance and momentous achievements in the international arena. Periodically, uh, sorry, personally, I believe that the principles of the movement are more relevant today than ever before, irrespective of what name is chosen or not as we move forward in dealing with the tremendous opportunities and immense challenges that this generation and this era brings to us. I also want to add 
that I really believe that India can be very proud of its achievements over the last 75 years. Needless, needless to say, in the era of globalization, India has achieved prominent economic development while keeping a healthy distance from the two poles by applying unwavering self-restraint policies to enhance its domestic affairs, um, preserve the well-being of its peoples. In fact, it is among the, fast, the fastest sustained growing economies in the era of globalization. And to do that with uh, India's size is something that is really uh, a very major and significant achievement. Examples of recent developments have been that each India has become a member of the emerging economies, the BRICS, alongside with, with Brazil, Russia, China, and South Africa, and joins meeting of the G8. Noteworthy as well is that your country is among the top 10 growing economies for several years now. Despite the pandemic, despite COVID-19, India was among the countries that witnessed GDP growth in the third quarter of 2021, uh, I believe reaching 12.7%. And uh, it is among the countries that is leading the bounce back economically from COVID-19. To its credit also, and this should not be ignored, in facing these challenges, India did not only serve its own population during the pandemic, but it also acted for the well being of the international community. It provided medical supplies to more than 150 countries worldwide, especially COVID 19 vaccines. <clears throat> Ladies and gentlemen, personally, I am not overly concerned about reviving, per se, the non aligned movement in its past role. I do not, however, believe that the movement or its or at least its leaders should back away from unwaveringly asserting the call for a higher moral code shared by, by its members and with the objective of achieving a more equitable world order, one that provides security and hopefully prosperity for all. I do believe that once again, the world is going through a period of disorder. And we will continue to see setbacks of this nature as long as inequities exist. In these circumstances, wise, vo wise voices of internationalism and multilateralism, equitable rights and opportunity are even more imperative. Considering the changing nature of the global system, as I say here frequently back home in Cairo, it is time for both Egypt and India, alongside with other member states, to reinvigorate their collective expressions on how to create a more equitable, stable, and secure world order. Bipolar politics, in my mind, are remnants of the past, even in light of the recent tragic events in, Ukra in Ukraine. Archaic balance of power concepts need to be replaced by contemporary universal concepts of collective security and a balance of interests. International institutions need to be reviewed and reformed. Para paramount issues such as excessive armaments and poverty reduction must again, must again remain, regain prominence. First of all, States need to rebuild the trust among themselves and open the door for constructive discussions to formulate a concrete agenda in order to regain the credible and influential role of, the, of our movement in the international arena. This, I seize this occasion to call for the re-engagement of the non-aligned movement countries in trying to conceptualize the path forward. Our states need to agree on a collective agenda around substantial international issues in order to restore collective positions and increase effectiveness. India, Egypt, and the former members of the movement as well as like-minded partners should adopt a contemporary initiative 
It is consistent with changing global politics while maintaining and affirming its fundamental concepts that are concerned with promoting country sovereignty, independence, and non-intervention in, in, in internal affairs. This initiative should encompass a number of issues and carry a distinct message, one that aims at asserting equity, international law, and the independence of states, and enhancing their ability to participate as effective players in the international arena. A particular concern is neocolonialism, which has been the new instrument for former colonial powers to interfere in internal affairs of developing countries. Some major powers have been using aid as a condition or a, a vehicle to interfere in formulating economic policies of developing countries in order to continue to maintain or preserve their dominance uh, or special positions with regarding to natural resources. Together, India and Egypt, with their regional and international influential positions, should support other countries in the quest to develop their economic sectors, thus enabling them to have a more independent stance on, global, on, on the global level. Such assistance can evolve into a comprehensive collective economic cooperation among states that will eventually enable them to be liberated from the change, chains of neocolonial powers. While enhancing their economic capacities, states with international st stature, such as India and Egypt, should cooperate in, the, in promoting the evolution of a fairer international order, which no longer depends on the balance of power but rather on the balance of interests of all countries. A number of substantial issues should be included in this common agenda, including, but not exclusively, reconsidering the peace and security international institutions. Needless to say, the UN is the most important institution that is responsible for the maintenance of international order, particularly global peace and security, and in this respect, particularly the Security Council. However, its membership is another remnant of post-World War II era. Equally archaic is the absolute right given to its permanent members to veto, which is a very dialectic and, and has hindered many substantive resolutions in an, in an unjustifiable manner. I'd recall that when the charter was first being drafted, the, an Egyptian jurist re recommended then that the, the, the provisions of the charter, and particularly uh, institutions like the Security Council, be reviewed every 25 years because the world order will be, will be changing from one generation to the other. This proposal, of course, was rejected at the time, uh, but I think it proves recent events. Uh, are evidence that it's, it was a very wise proposal then and remains a valid one today, even if it is not one which we are able to implement uh, in the near future. I suggest that we need to adopt an initiative that calls for amending the rules of procedure of the Security Council to ensure that veto will not conflict with collective interest and security of the international community. Needless to say, any suggestion on this matter will be encountered by the veto countries. Nevertheless, I believe that countries like Egypt, like Egypt and India have a moral responsibility to initiate a proposal robustly. It is not fair to indefinitely give a group of countries more privileges than the rest, especially that the permanent members of the Security Council do not seem to be bearing the responsibilities that they a hold in this, in this capacity. In essence, we need to embrace the promotion of democracy and equality, not exclusively on the national level, that included, but it also needs to be generated uh, on international. International affairs need to be democratized. It is imperative that our two countries play a leading role in international disarmament efforts as well. 
particularly with respect to weapons of mass destruction, nuclear, chemical, and biological, as well as their means of delivery. Global nuclear disarmament is ever so important. Equally important is cooperation between our two countries to ensure that outer space does not become another stratosphere for military and arms competition. It should be invested for peaceful purposes for the benefit of mankind. As important as hard security issues are, I cannot overemphasize the importance of cooperation in combating extremism and terrorism, both, the, both by way of policy, education, socioeconomic issues, as well as hard security issues. States like India and Egypt also bear a special responsibility in pursuing robust diplomatic actions towards resolving inter and intrastate military conflicts by assertively and unwaveringly supporting states' integrity and sovereignty and respect for international law. In the economic sphere, the overwhelming majority of the members of our global village are emerging economies. India and Egypt need to play a more robust, in fact, leading role in reshaping not only politically, but also finan the financial and economic international system to be more democratic, more inclusive, and more equitable. This means that the membership of different economic groups need to be expanded to include more countries from developing nations. The current system is only permitting a limited number of countries to have a say in the international economic order, which are directly, uh, in, excuse me, in international economic decisions, which are directly or indirectly imposed on the rest of the world by inequitable decision-making process. In short, and I don't think I'm exaggerating that much in this respect, I really do believe that the developing countries are being deprived from deciding their own des destiny. A fairer voting system for the international financial institutions, such as the International Monetary Fund, is important. Calculating growth uh, presently remains based on global resources of assets, markets, and production facilities. And I don't think it really takes into account enough the circumstances that each of our countries uh, face. Members of the movement should start the change from inside by adopting funding mechanisms to support small and medium projects within their midst. Such projects will promote the independence of national economies of the developing countries and foster their position against intervention or exploitation. As everyone knows, Egypt will be hosting COP27 in November 2022, dealing with climate change. It is important in this respect to emphasize that joint efforts in combating and mitigating the consequences of climate change comprehensively as a global challenge and a global responsibility. This should be done inclusively with the least possible effort on legitimate efforts to pursue growth and prosperity in developing countries, especially given that these countries historically are the least culpable in climate, uh, climate change or, uh, re, uh, in the causes for climate change. All countries have to develop more efficiently with fewer ramifications on global climate change. This can only be done in the developed world if the proper, appropriate support is provided by the developed country in their transformation to enable transformation from, techno from present technologies and allow for the diversification of energy sources 
as the developed world transforms more aggressively towards green, clean energy sources. My concluding remark is actually a call for uniting our cause to revive the influential role of India and Egypt in the international arena, to be able to participate as effective players in decision-making and the renovation of the international agenda. I believe this revival will benefit the common good of the globalized world that induces us to work together for the well being of the international community. Many of my colleagues here in Egypt, when they listen to me making these points, believe the remnants of the past, of an era that has gone beyond us, and that we live today in a real politic material world that doesn't leave much room for. Uh, conceptualizing new concepts uh, or policies. I would argue that the establishment of United Nations was in fact almost a miracle after a period of tremendous devastation. But I don't believe that the institution has really fulfilled its uh, uh, ambitions or met the expectations for the developed world after so many years of having been in existence. And I do believe whether it is globally, as we see now in, in Europe or in my own region in the Middle East, I, I, I don't believe that there is a level of security or stability that allows us really to look into the future with much confidence and optimism. That being said, countries like India and my own country, do not have the luxury of being complacent. We carry a moral responsibility to engage in trying to build a more equitable system, one that is uh, both realistic, but also ethical and practical and, and principled at the same time. And I see in the polarization that exists today uh, between the previous superpowers and in the emergence of a series of new emerging states, I see in that situation an opportunity really and the responsibility for both your country and mine to start reinvigorating their role and the, the position they took in the online movement to try to bring in a wise internationalist voice in establishing the new world order. Let me seize this occasion with these brief comments to once, once again convey my highest and warmest congratulations to India, its people on this special occasion and the celebration. I reiterate, I am very proud to have been invited to join you today and I hope these comments were useful. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Nabil. Uh, thank you very much uh, for that very thought-provoking uh, presentation. And uh, also, I would like to uh, thank you very much uh, for honoring us with your presence uh, in helping us, uh, you know, celebrating with us the 75th anniversary of India's uh, independence. Um, you know, one, what was very striking about your uh, presentation was uh, that, uh, you know, you, you have... Uh, articulated uh, something which uh, I have also felt that, uh, uh, you know, it is really in a period of transition, it is in a period of change that spaces open up uh, for, you know, new ideas uh, to germinate, some new concepts to, uh, in, in fact, uh, take us in a perhaps a different direction. And I do believe that uh, currently uh, that is precisely the kind of a you know, geopolitical landscape uh, that we are finding ourselves in. Um, you know, there is uncertainty all around. We, for example, don't know uh, how this uh, war in Ukraine is going to end. I mean, it's continued now for more than a month and the immense amount of suffering and, uh, and, and uh, you know, violence that we have seen, you know, uh, uh, generated uh, during this, uh, during this uh, conflict. Um, you know, perhaps uh, many of us had believed that uh, something like this may no longer be uh, possible, but uh, it has been uh, shown that it is uh, possible. 
so we cannot afford to be complacent uh, because uh, today uh, we cannot, in fact, insulate ourselves uh, from what is happening, uh, you know, in another part of the uh, world. Uh, so I take your point that, uh, you know, here is uh, a uh, opportunity uh, for countries like India and Egypt uh, to really rethink uh, what is the kind of role that they can play in uh, perhaps uh, orienting the, the uh, change that is taking place in a direction which, as you mentioned, uh, is uh, more democratic, uh, it is more uh, equitable, uh, more uh, you know, mindful of uh, justice, it is more inclusive. Uh, these are uh, concepts that I think uh, bear, uh, you know, reaffirming. And uh, uh, I think uh, it, is, it is important to raise our voices uh, in this respect. Uh, at a time, uh, Nabil, when uh, you and I were working together in the Committee on Disarmament, uh, I dare say both our countries were somewhat weaker than what we are today. Uh, and yet, uh, you know, despite the fact that in terms of our military capabilities or in terms of our economic capabilities, we were perhaps at a lower threshold than we are today. And yet, it is the power of ideas uh, which really propelled us uh, forward. Uh, so I don't think we should underestimate the power of, uh, of, of ideas. Uh, in this uh, uh, respect, I wanted to uh, ask you, you know, you mentioned, you mentioned the fact that uh, even in Egypt, people say, well, you know, we should be thinking about real politics, you know, perhaps this is no longer <laughs> a, a world in which uh, we can afford to be, uh, have some kind of, uh, you know, idealistic uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, frame of mind. Um, but, but I believe actually this is not idealism. This is more real politics than what people are talking about. Uh, because ultimately, uh, what drives uh, countries, it is their interest. I mean, we, our interest is to see the welfare and development of our people. And if you do not have a congenial kind of an international environment, how do you pursue your development goals? Uh, so I think this is fundamental to even some of the real politic uh, objectives that we are uh, talking about. Now, uh, let me, let me uh, point out that that kind of, uh, shall I say, transactional way of thinking, a more narrower focus on what we see as the interests of our respective countries. Um, you know, we have, we have, uh, there is no doubt that we have lost some of the earlier uh, focus. Uh, what I would like to ask you as someone who has been, you know, uh, over a long period of time, have seen the kind of changes that have taken place in the, uh, in the global landscape. Um, how, how do you feel, uh, you know, we can, uh, a, 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 a kind of uh, coming together of powers like uh, Egypt, uh, like India, after all, uh, if you recall, you know, in in uh, in 1960s, early 60s, it was leaders like um, uh, the, the leaders of Egypt, of Ghana, of Indonesia, of uh, even Cambodia, India, who actually came together uh, and 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 uh, gave the world uh, a new way of looking at international relations. In the current context, I mean, we are living in a very different kind of world. In the current context, and particularly taking advantage of the crisis that we are we are uh, confronted with, uh, what is it that uh, we can do? Because what I see, uh, I don't know about Egypt so much, but what I see uh, in some of the major emerging economies is uh, is a very defensive reaction. You know, there are pressures. Oh, you must take a stand. You must, uh, you know, join the sanctions. You must do this or you must do that. And the reaction is essentially a rather defensive uh, reaction from. I do not see a kind of an active role, uh, a, a sort of um, you know role to try and actually see what we can do together uh, to bring about an end to this uh, crisis. Um, do you have any ideas in that respect? I mean, what is it that uh, uh, if 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 um, you know we have to sit together as Egypt and India? Uh, what could we do together? I mean, what what is the kind of mobilization of international opinion that we could bring about? Thank you, Ambassador Saran. Uh, 
I will try to respond to that concretely, but let me just simply, before doing that, add the following. For many years, and I know you faced much of this as well, uh, our larger friends, larger countries would contact us in the Middle East and tell us what they thought we should do from both sides. Nevertheless, war and peace in the Middle East was always done by regional states, always decided by regional states. But they would always tell us, this is what you should do, this is what you should do. And occasionally, quite offensively, with talking points that really were written by amateurs. Uh, that being said, uh, for the last 10 years, they look at our region and don't understand it. So they keep asking us now, what do you want to do? Rather than telling us what you should be doing, they're actually asking us, what do you want to do? And it's an opportunity. And I tell my colleagues here, we don't have to be 100% correct, but we need to provide the vision for the future. What is the social contract that we're looking for for our peoples domestically between our different nations in the region? And I would argue that in terms of our common objectives, India and Egypt, we bear this responsibility for the international order as a whole. That's what we were doing with the online movement. It wasn't a defensive posture, it was partially defensive, but it was essentially trying to create, an, as, as you said earlier, a third voice, a different voice. Let me also add here, and this is what we're facing in Ukraine. The problem which would happen in Ukraine, and I recently wrote an article, is everybody's mistaken here. And the reason is the two powers still, according to the Cold War, believe that they have spheres of influence that neither side should, should cross. And then they each pick and choose when they decide to cross it or not, depending on if the other power is at a high point or at a weak point. And we all end up paying the consequences. So I criticized Russia and the West for what happened in Ukraine, because as a medium-sized state, I cannot condone under any circumstance entering into a neighboring state uh, by force. But I also understand how the West kept pushing the, this concept of spheres of influence when they felt the Russians were at a weak point. So it is, and I, let me add here, President Putin told me personally in 2014, I'm going to get back my dignity. So this is not a surprise, but I nevertheless openly said, I will not condone using force again, because I'm a medium sized state. So you, you're, you had tremendous successes in globalization uh, and we are regaining our confidence now. But I actually believe that we are among the larger powers in the medium world intellectually. And we've played that role. I mean, you and I, you remember this when we were often criticized by the larger countries for speaking out on everything. Uh, because our leaders wanted us to be vocal on the international order. Uh, I completely agree with you. The power of ideas is what we should be using. It should center around international law. Because in all candidness, I'm not going to fight wars against China, the US, or the Russians. That does not serve my interest or my ability as Egypt. And most countries will not choose to do that either. But that does not mean that I will accept what they may want to do. And my, my basic pillar of security is international law. So an international law is not only what was written back in, in, in when the UN was established or when there was a Cold War. Uh, I would argue that if this is not realistic to do, I mean, I'd love to have our leaders go off on short retreats to talk about visions of the political system, visions of the economic system, visions of 
how we deal with global issues, like if you want healthcare for that matter, uh, or climate change. Uh, if that can't be done for practical reasons, then frankly, I would love to see them designate shepherds to sit down for longer periods of time to work on the future agenda. What do we actually want as a future agenda? Uh, I am not particularly comfortable with the efficacy of the UN presently, but I'm not going to destroy the building because I'm not satisfied with its, with its production. Therefore, I think we should be able to take points of the common agenda to the UN and or in the different groupings that we meet uh, to, to develop these issues. If, if you give you just one tangent example, the whole debate about climate change presently, uh, one of the uh, interesting points is how calculation of carbon emissions are, are counted and monetized. And the way it's done presently favors the developed world completely at the expense of the developing world. Uh, well, they're not going to come up with these solutions. We need to do this. And I think, frankly, we need to bring our minds together. Uh, let me close here with institutions like yours, by the way, uh, working with institutions like ours here or others should be brought together, not necessarily to issue a statement immediately, but to develop these ideas in a specialized fashion. And I can share with you that I just finished here at our school, a two year study on the future of the Middle East, a projection for an Arab world with a better future. And we came up with policy recommendations on everything from security to economic and social development issues. Now, will these all be implemented? Of course not. And probably they're probably not all correct either. But leaving that vacuum, I mean, we're, Egypt and India are leaving a vacuum that should not be left open, especially in a period of transition. Uh, thank you, uh, Nabeel. Uh, among the uh, sort of uh, questions that uh, uh, arise is, um, you know, uh, people are interested in, you mentioned uh, COP27, that Egypt will be uh, a host and that would be a very important role it would have to uh, play. Uh, the uh, larger uh, issue is that, uh, you know, uh, most of the challenges that we are confronted with today uh, you mentioned, uh, of course, climate change, but you also mentioned, say, uh, the issue of terrorism, uh, the issue of, uh, you know, if you take even uh, the issue of uh, proliferation of weapons of mass uh, destruction, but it is, has by no means become something which we don't need to worry about anymore. Um, you have outer space, you mentioned, as one of the areas where uh, we need to be able to come together and have rules of the game. Cybersecurity, uh, it is a completely anarchic uh, domain uh, where there are really no rules of the game at all. Uh, and yet uh, it is so fundamental today to our economic uh, activities, to our uh, even, even our day-to-day -day living. Uh, so here is the paradox that precisely at a time where we are faced with challenges uh, which are essentially cross-domain in character, are essentially cross-national in character. They are not amenable to be resolved either through national means or through even regional means. Uh, you see the world uh, going backwards in a sense. You mentioned that you don't have much hope, uh, for example, in trying to uh, get the United Nations to really uh, you know, uh, act, uh, act in, 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 uh, uh, in, the, in the favor of uh, you know, uh, a more multi multilateralist approach. But yes, uh, yet it would seem that uh, there is really no alternative to that. Now, one of the things that I wanted to uh, ask you is, uh, you know, we uh, worked very, very hard through uh, the United Nations, through those institutions. You know, if you take the CD, for example, you remember the special sessions on disarmament that, uh, you know, 
what essentially initiative of the of the major developing countries uh, in 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 uh, bringing about that awareness that look uh, no matter how much we try to deal with these issues through national you know efforts uh, and you know this there is this uh, this uh, shall i say a upsurge of more narrower form of nationalism across the world uh, it, 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 you can see this uh, almost uh, uh, in in every part of the world uh, what is it that uh, uh, you know given the kind of history that we had of the non aligned movement because there was a sense that i cannot actually promote my interest unless i look at it as part and parcel of a larger interest so if you look at non aligned movement it is it is that sense isn't it that it's not a question of my not pursuing my interest but i would be better able to pursue my interest if i take the larger interest of the other developing emerging economies into account and mobilize uh, their uh, their effort uh, so in especially since you spoke about uh, cop 27 and egypt being uh, being the host um, is there some way that we can really bring about uh that kind of awareness uh, amongst uh, the major uh, you know developing uh, countries and it, it actually lead a movement towards the revival of multilateralism uh because without i see no alternative to that in terms of you know dealing with some of the challenges that we are uh, facing uh, is that something that you know especially since cop 27 is coming Uh, is there something that egypt and india can perhaps do together in that respect uh, this will be my last uh, question to you sure first of all as as you mentioned earlier here back home i often hear people arguing we should focus on egypt first and it's always a a point that drives me crazy because that's what we do anyway it's always about egypt first as diplomats we're not looking for somebody else's interest but if you define your country's interest correctly it's not a transaction it's an investment and it relates to the cost today and the consequences tomorrow and and there and so i live my country lives in two continents actually africa and asia on two seas mediterranean and the red sea uh a very significant amount of my needs are brought in from abroad be they economic civilian military you name it including water for that matter i can't be isolated we would not function so i need to engage the world and i need to create a playing field for myself around the world that is more palatable and equitable therefore being an activist in terms of ideas in changing the world order or making it more equitable is imperative for me to succeed of course if i'm doing that here and india is doing that in your part of the world and brazil is doing it in latin america and i name other countries but we take too much time uh you generate more of a if you want a constructive pressure towards positive engagement and i would even add that i don't want i cannot and i don't want to ignore the americans or the russians for that matter or the chinese i need them as well i'm sure they the, and they and they're not, yeah exactly so i'm looking for a conclusive system but it's one where they have to keep hearing from a collective voice that this is important and let me share with you something quickly when i was foreign minister i remember having discussions with john kerry at the time and i told him and i i knew him as a senator for many years and i said john what surprises me about american foreign foreign policy establishment is you only explain foreign policy to your people as a potential threat not as a positive even though you're the one that gains most about the world because you're so efficient and so strong and so powerful and he said you're right because that's the way we've been thinking since uh since world war 
we actually need to help the big powers help us. Because if we don't speak out, they don't feel the economic pressure, the, the intellectual pressure to respond. And I would argue uh, most of our governments have to respond first to the immediate needs, but they cannot afford and do not have the luxury of saying, I won't think about the future. Therefore, they should invite others who don't deal with immediate needs to start looking at what are the pathways for the future. On, on COP27, I gave you an example of the pricing or monetizing uh, carbon emissions. Uh, another example, frankly, uh, Africa in particular has about 17% of the world's population and only emits 4% of carbon emissions. Uh, but for it to continue to do that and develop, it needs to engage in modern technologies that are costly, which we can't afford. And I know the equation in India, and you have a, 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 a scope that is quite enormous. <clears throat> but if we're going to all work together, our voices need to be raised with the rich countries that if you want a solution to climate change in your part of the world, it starts or at least includes our part of the world as well. And if there's something that we can do to make our systems more efficient, we will do it. But it, and even at, if you want wise investments, but it cannot be that you've developed your economies at our expense and we stop trying to develop looking to the future. But I would focus most of all, uh, let me just add a point here. This is going to take time. We're not going to be able to change the world order overnight. I would never claim that. Uh, uh, I'm not sure we're going to succeed anyway, but the idea of contributing to that was not, is not going to be a transaction. We, we can't afford not to, because if we don't engage in this, our situations in the future will be less equitable than they are now. And I would argue that uh, engaging together on these different issues uh, would give us a stronger voice I am critical of the UN because like you, I'm a strong opponent of the UN and my aspirations for it are very strong, but I don't criticize it as an institution as much as I do because I realize that it is an inter inter intergovernmental institution. So if we don't speak out there, it cannot function. I remember sit sitting in, in, in General Assembly listening to your leaders talk about nuclear disarmament and making proposals. And many of the countries there saying, well, this is just talk. Uh, frankly, it was good talk. It was useful talk. It was important talk, even if, even if it didn't succeed. But are we to leave this again? I mean, I, I would like to change, frankly, gradually these concepts of balance of power these concepts that each of you has a sphere of influence, uh, but it's not going to change unless we start developing a new world. Yeah. So I, I think, uh, you know, uh, you, uh, let me uh, end uh, on this note. Uh, you mentioned that we have to think beyond a balance of power. Uh, I think one of the realities of uh, today's world, and we see this uh, demonstrated very, very dramatically in Ukraine itself, that uh, we, there are very, very real limits to coercive power. You know, because after all, balance of power mm -hmm. is based on, you know, who has, who has uh, coercive power to be able to coerce others or, to, or, the, or the threat of coercive power uh, to get your own way. Uh, we have found for the last several years now um, that it, whether you take the war in Iraq or whether you take the war in Afghanistan, and I really believe that what is happening in Ukraine is also a demonstration of the futility of using coercive power uh, to gain your ends. Uh, it, is, it is no longer uh, feasible. Uh, so from, from that point of view, uh, I think um, 
you know, uh, Nabil, if we can uh, really think in terms of, as I, as I said, I believe greatly in the power of ideas. I, I think uh, that is uh, something that is uh, yeah, very heavily underrated <laughs> these days. Uh, so if we can uh, really, um, you know, Egypt and perhaps uh, the institution which you had, even the Center for Policy Research, where we are thinking in terms of, you know, new ways of dealing with these challenges, uh, it would be very worthwhile perhaps for us to engage in a conversation, uh, you know, between ourselves, uh, between uh, some, some uh, you know, thinkers on these issues here in India and perhaps uh, led by you, a few of the people here in, in oh. Egypt. Uh, can, we, can we start a conversation like that? Uh, I'd I would be to start very happy to, uh, you know, to, uh, to have this kind of a conversation. I'd love to start an intellectual conversation with your center or a group managed by your center about the New World Order. Okay, okay. From, so, from, the, from the perspective of, of medium-sized states. Sure, sure. Uh, <coughs> uh, so what I would uh, propose is that, uh, you know, I will, I will uh, along with Yamini, uh, think uh, how we can, we can uh, initiate this uh, and share it with you. And uh, let's let's uh, give it a try and see where it takes us. Because uh, I find we talk uh, much more with our colleagues in the US, uh, colleagues in the UK. Uh, we have very few conversations with uh, yeah. you know our, our uh, Asian and uh, African and Arab uh, colleagues. Uh, so I think that would be a good contribution if we can make uh, if we can bring that about. So thank you very much, uh, Nabil. It has been an absolute uh, pleasure, very educative for us. You know, we in India do not always hear voices from uh, your part of the world. <laughs> we are still very heavily oriented uh, towards the West. Uh, so it is, it is very refreshing for us uh, to get a perspective uh, from somebody as authoritative as you uh, on how we should be really looking at uh, what is a very, very rapidly changing world order. Thank you very much. And we will be in touch. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.